Brian Jones, thank you very much. Thank you. So I thought we would start, one of the things that we do at the Grace and Mercy Foundation, you guys, if you've been to an NCS retreat, uh, you've maybe seen a demonstration of the public reading of scripture, and, and one of the ways that we do that, and we do that in our offices in Manhattan three times a week, but uh, not knowing how much you're going to take away from what I have to share today, I want to make sure that we give God a chance to speak to us this morning. And so I thought we would just open our time with uh, uh, just a listening to Psalm 144, just as an opening prayer to get us uh, going this morning. So um, if you will, we'll enter into that together. This is from the Word of Promise Dramatized Bible, and it's, uh, it's not long, just a couple of minutes. So Psalm 144. Psalm 144, a Psalm of David. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. My loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him? Or the son of man that you are mindful of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Bow down your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Flash forth lightning and scatter them. Shoot out your arrows and destroy them. Stretch out your hand from above. Rescue me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speaks lying words and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O God. On a harp of ten strings, I will sing praises to you, the one who gives salvation to kings, who delivers David, his servant, from the deadly sword. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners, whose mouth speaks lying words, and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as pillars sculptured in palace style, that our barns may be full, supplying all kinds of produce, that our sheep may bring forth mm. thousands and ten thousands in our fields, that our oxen may be well laden, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no outcry in our streets, happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Okay. Let me, <clears throat> let me pray for us this morning. So, Father, we uh, I just wait upon you, Lord, to just ask you to be here, Holy Spirit, to be here in our midst, to um, just... Uh, speak to us today, Lord. Thank you for your word that speaks to us. Thank you for the community, Father, that we are in that speaks to us and that you work through these things. So, Father, I just pray that whatever words I have to speak are your words, that you would uh, have this conversation go the way that you want it to go this morning. And thank you for each one here, Father. I pray your blessing, your favor, your awareness, Lord, your tenderness to extend to each one in this room and that uh, you would multiply their efforts, their calling, their purpose in this life, Father, to, to be about the work that you've called them to do, Lord. All of us have such work to do. The, we know, Father, that the, uh, <clears throat> that the laborers are few, but the harvest is ripe. And so we go into that harvest today, Father, with ambition and with eagerness and with a calling. And so we just pray that we would talk about those things today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so just a plug on that. Let me just invite you, if you're ever in Manhattan and you want to join us for Public Reading of Scripture, we do it Monday nights for dinner, Wednesdays for lunch, Fridays for breakfast, food provided every time. And uh, we do it at 57th and 7th Avenue, amazing views of the park, about an hour, no teaching, just coming together in community. We think there's incredible power in the idea of listening to God's Word together in community, and we'll have... 50 to 80 people there for each of those sessions. Uh, and so you're always welcome. I'll, I'll probably leave a stack of business cards over there. Uh, feel free to email me when you want, and uh, we'll get you on the list and, and get you there, but you're always welcome. 
So thank you. I am incredibly honored and uh, privileged to be here today, uh, and humbled, actually, to be able to just speak to you for a few minutes. Uh, as Paul uh, and I, uh, Paul asked me to come out and do this, uh, having heard me in a different setting tell a little bit of my story. So I think, I think where I'd like to go today is, is just to really tell a little bit of my story, because I think as we listen to each other's stories and we see how God stirs us and then provides uh, for us in times of great change, in times of great opportunity, um, we can be encouraged by that. And so that's really my prayer, is really to, to come and just share my story and some elements in hopes that God would use that to encourage you in your own journey and in your own walk. Um, as I step back to go, uh, what is it that's maybe a little unique about me? And I think there are a couple of things. One is, as mentioned, I do have six children. I'll tell you a little bit about that here, how we got there. That is a little bit crazy, especially uh, in, the, in the line of work that I do and in the world that we live in. And then secondly is just having made some pretty radical changes along the way. It's kind of like the, you know, we all like to watch the, the guy who's lit himself up on fire and <laughs> see what happens when, he, uh, when he's burning. So I'll tell you a little bit of those stories and the like. So um, anyways, where do I sit today? So I'm 53 years old, married <clears throat> 30 years. We have six children ranging in age from 26 down to eight years old. The, uh, the oldest uh, is a graduate of the Naval Academy, married to another Academy uh, grad, and they're in San Diego, about to have our first grandbaby. So that's super exciting this month. And number two son is a senior at the Academy, and he is going to graduate and be a Marine. Number three is in college, Baylor University, Waco, Texas, great place. Uh, number four, uh, five, and six are all home with us. Uh, four is an 11th grader, five is a 12-year-old, uh, and six is an 8-year-old. So we, we have quite the span, got a lot of years of parenting still ahead of us. But uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 real, the real thing I'd like to talk about is sort of how do we get there, right? So we started, uh, my wife and I uh, met in Acapulco on spring break, so college year, senior. Good things do come from spring break, uh, but we did meet on the beach. <laughs> And, uh, and, and God put us together in, in, a, in, a, in a pretty amazing way. I, uh, I went to college in, uh, I guess, 84. Fall of 84 is when I started. And uh, I thought I was going to go into ministry and into seminary. And as I got into that, uh, I, there was something that happened uh, in the freshman, sophomore year around the senior pastor of the church that we were a part of. I was part of in college. And it sort of derailed me. Um, he had a falling from grace and wasn't quite sure how to process it. And my ambition went from really a, what I thought was going to be a calling to full-time ministry, quote-unquote, into business. And so I, uh, my, I, I changed my major to accounting, got you know, focused on that, wanted to be on the cover of Business Week by the time I was 30. Not a great goal, but that was it. And, and so I set out to, uh, to really do some of that. I, I, I fell in love with the investment banking business, had an opportunity to see what uh, I worked for Bear Stearns, and uh, what they did in an internship, and God provided an amazing opportunity for me to do that uh, back in the late 80s, and, and so that started, uh, my wife and I, we got married about a year out of school, and uh, at 23 years old, we, um, I would, I tell you that because for the next 13 years as I'm climbing the ladder of success at Bear Stearns, I am also struggling with this idea of, is this the right calling, or does God have something else for me back, and, you know, this is, this is just what I'm doing to pay the bills, but is it, you know, should I really be a pastor or on the way to being a pastor of a church? Um, God gave amazing uh, success, really just not because of my own efforts, just great opportunities and great, great uh, situations to be able to do that, so I found myself at a young age, a partner of, of Bear Stearns, and still having this constant struggle about where is it that I'm supposed to be? How do we put boundaries around it? And I think God was really teaching us in that journey about how to put boundaries around the, the pressures of that. And so we, uh, I'll just tell you some of, the, some of the experiences we had. So we were in Los Angeles to start 
Uh, we got, you know, after five years with Bear Stearns in Los Angeles, they moved me to New York. Uh, and we came to New York and lived here in Stanford, just a wonderful place uh, back in the mid-90s. We loved that. Uh, and yet, at the time, I started to look at it and say, you know, I think this is not going to work long term for my family. The pressures of investment banking and the hours that I was going to have to keep. We only had two children at the time. That's all we set out to have was two children. And, uh, and yet, in the middle of that, we, uh, we started to go, okay, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to you know, continue to, to say yes to what God wants us to do? but also make sure that we're winning on all these different things because it's not just enough to win at profession. We want to all win, right? As men of God, we all want to win on all these different areas. And that's the challenge of life and the challenge of balance, and, which is so elusive. We, we, I really don't like that idea of balance. And so for us, that meant um, a move. And I, I said, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to make this work with that long commute to and from New York and the like. And uh, and so I'm, I'm willing to lose my job and, uh, and yet, you know, uh, preserve the family. And so we started to go through this uh, uh, process of what's that look like. And, and, and I, had, I raised my hand to the firm and said, hey, I want to move to the Dallas office. And so in 1997, we moved to the Dallas office with two children. And, uh, and, and that extended my time with Bear for another five years or so. What ended up happening in that process is a missionary came to stay with us because we had opened up our house in, uh, in Dallas to, to missionaries. And this guy came, and he, he was a missionary to Japan. I know we have a missionary here to Africa. Had nine children in Japan, which is, as you can imagine, crazy in Japan. And so, uh, he, uh, so he, uh, he started to challenge us. He says, hey, Brian. I know you're doing okay on the business front, but what about on the family front? Are you not showing a little too much uh, faith in yourself and not enough faith in God? And, and he's the reason we have six children, I would say, all right, uh, is that because he started to convict me. He says, you know what? If the Bible says children are a blessing of the Lord, who are you to say that they're not? And are you not willing to take as many children as God gives you? That was... Uh, that was 1999 or 98. And so that set my wife and I on this journey of saying, okay, we need to be more open to what God has, not just in family, but just generally in life. And so uh, number three baby came along, and then number four baby came along, and then we're like, uh, I'm not sure we have enough faith for this. Uh, but anyways, then number five baby came along, and, uh, and, and we're like, wow, God, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine what you're calling us to. Uh, number six child, we ended up adopting from China, and so, uh, which was a family project, and I'll get there in just a minute. So in, as we're going down this journey, um, we're learning to listen to God, right, as we're all walking this. I think one of the things I want to encourage all of us in and remind us about is, I think in my experience, what in order to combat what is the pressures of, of, of the careers that we're all in, we have to be so diligent about nurturing that calling of God, that, that voice of God that's coming to us and cultivating. If, if, we, if you listen to Scripture over and over, in like Chronicles, it talks about these kings having a tender heart towards God. And so, uh, you know, what I, would, what, what I found is, is, is this struggle because you've got, you know, more to do than you have time to do. But as God speaks to really take the time to, to, to just try to call, carve out that space to listen. And so for, for me, that meant <clears throat> along the way many things. That meant, uh, I, I brought some books here I'll tell you about in a second, reading, all, reading a lot of different books, investing in an internal mindset, investing in things that repositioned my mind around things so that when, when these radical change ideas came up, then we would be prepared to take them and that we could hear God's voice and do it in confidence. So to get to, to, the, to, to some of these steps, so moving from Connecticut to, to Texas was a bit of a bold move. Um, and then uh, ultimately as we were there, uh, we were on our way back to New York after a few years as my responsibilities had increased and and, and, and my wife and I looked at it and we said, you know, I think God's stirring in us to do something different. And so at 36 years old, I, I, I of my own choice, stepped down and quit. 
uh, and instead went to work. Uh, I had about a three-year transition there where I went to work for uh, a public company as a potential CEO. That didn't work out. And then in the middle of that, uh, at the end of that, the, you know, I, I was exploring different things. And I tell you what, God had been, uh, we'd been doing a, a lot of work with a, a local church in Dallas called Park City's Presbyterian. And the, uh, my wife and I were really praying about what's next. We had, we had been living this life where, you know, your cost of, your, your standard of living rises at like 1.05x your, your income, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's just like you're, you're spending the money as it's coming in. And yet God had said, hey, you know, what about a radical change here? And so uh, I got the phone call to be, uh, join this church as an executive director. We had 100 people on staff and 5,000 members. And we're living in this 8,000 square foot house. And, you know, it was amazing. It was as if the, you know, God, the phone rang and I said to my wife, I said, I think the church is calling to ask us to come do this. And I said, are you, you know, I took the phone and that's what it was. And we prayed about it. And we really just said, you know, God is doing that. He's calling us to step out in faith. And we had had some success, but not enough to quit and not work again. And so we ended up selling this house and going on staff at the church with the, and going back to seminary with the idea that this might be a long-term calling. Again, going back to the struggle that I had had during that time, um, you know, I, I, I really was wrestling with this call, marketplace or business. So as we got through uh, and did that for a couple of years, that's when baby four came. Um, and we uh, started to think about, okay, um, you know, seminary. And I, I tell you, it was, uh, it was not an easy journey, but it was one where, uh, you know, through that, God uh, was showing us his truth, his confidence, his faithfulness. And so out of that, we were exploring, okay, either I'm going to do seminary and graduate and get the Master's of Divinity degree, or was going to go back into business. And in 2005, um, started a private equity fund uh, that I had been approached about, which was a uh, crazy entrepreneurial journey. Um, we have um, uh, then, uh, we, we've really been... Um, about this idea of family, about integration, and about calling and raising our children for true greatness. And so along the way, as we're having all these children, my wife is an amazing person, but we, uh, we set out to really integrate that together well. And so it was as if it were an, such an important priority for me. We did some creative things that I thought might be helpful for you guys to know, which we still do today. One is that we set and have a marriage staff meeting. It's not very sexy. It's not very, you know, exciting to many, but it is something that we've chosen to do. I put together an agenda like it's a business meeting. And I come together. We do it on Thursdays. In Dallas, we did it at lunchtime. We do it often here on Thursdays at lunch. And it is a business meeting. You go through all of the matters of family, right? And it's whether it's big picture vision, 20-year plans, or what's happening in the next two days that we need to deal with. Um, I know, you know, some of your wives would go, I resist that, I hate that. But for my wife, she loves that because it gets us on the same page. She has the ability to change that agenda when we show up. But ultimately, uh, if she doesn't have anything on her mind, we go with that agenda. So that's one of those things. Um, we've, um, we do family worship, evening worship every night. It's the center point of our family, and it's something that uh, we've done for now 25 years, 26 years of having children. Um, and I think it's the little things that we do along that a long process, as, as Eugene Peterson would say, a long obedience in the same direction where you start to see the fruit and, and sowing and reaping, and, and those things are very in, in, intentional. Um, you know, as we get into the, um, uh, to the, to about seven, eight years ago, or n uh, I guess nine years ago, my wife came home one day and she said, Brian, she goes, um, well, let me back up. So one of the other things we did with our children a lot was we would take them um, and put them in different places uh, where they, like we took mission trips to very poor parts of the world and we wanted to give them a chance to see different things 
to really challenge them in different ways. We, we raised our kids with this idea that they're raised for the battleground, not for the playground. That was a theme in our house. I think that's why we have two at the Naval Academy. Um, but in any case, we, uh, we, we really had that mindset. And so as we visited some of these places, 2010, we were in Africa and we saw these orphans, you know, 12 of them in one room, triple bunked, sharing bunks. And our kids came away and said, wow, mom and dad, that's just amazing. These kids, they're just like us but it, they have no opportunity. And so our kids really started saying, what if we adopted one? And we're going, we already have five of you. Uh, but uh, the kids you know, kept up with that idea and God was stirring on our heart so that one day my wife came home and, and said, uh, Brian, you know, I, I, um, I know this is a crazy idea. I know we're 45 years old or 43 at the time, uh, but I think we're called to adopt. And, uh, and so we... I, you know, prayed about it, but very quickly said yes. I mean, I think, you know, as Paul, you know, positioned my talk today, I think that the, the real message I wanted to bring here was, you know, just when God's stirring on us, that we were willing to say yes and take big risks. And this was, a, I thought, a fairly big risk. Um, we, uh, we wanted to uh, adopt a special needs child. Uh, so we adopted a, a kid who was in an orphanage in China, uh, but the kids, uh, it was a family project, and we took all of the children, we sat them down, and we said, I know, God, we think God's stirring us to do this, but we're not going to do it at everybody's end. And so we sat, all the kids, by the way, kids are alphabetically named, A, B, C, D, E, F. And so A, B, C, D, and E were all sitting around in the circle, and, and with mom and dad, we said, okay, I need a verbal yes from every one of you that you're in for this project, right? And so, you know, that included at the time a one-and-a-half-year-old. <laughs> uh, but everybody else is like, yes. And so we did that. And then we set out on this adoption journey, which has just been amazing. Uh, the, the, our, our little boy turns nine in about two weeks. And uh, he was in an orphanage for 18 months. And then we were able to go pick him up in China and bring him home. Um, I, I think, you know, as we did that, then the boys went off to the Naval Academy. And then God started to stir in us again to say, hey, you're safe here in Dallas, Texas. I think, you know, you're calling. We, God, God was stirring in us to move to New York and to live in Manhattan. So about seven years ago, uh, we sold our house. We packed up and we moved to Manhattan with uh, five children still home <clears throat> and uh, four of them sharing one room and uh, the other one sleeping on a couch in the, in the, in the family room. But it was, it's been quite that journey. Now we still have three at home, uh, but ultimately God is now at 53 stirring in us uh, the plan for the next 20 to 30 years. And so what I would like to challenge all of us in this room to listen to is, is as you cultivate that, call, that, that relationship with God and that calling um, and, and that sense of connection with the Holy Spirit, He's giving us these messages to say yes to. He's giving us things to jump in and take risks about. Um, you know, whether it's, it's crazy job changes, um, whether it's crazy um, family changes, whether it's balance and, is, and, uh, and boundaries that you're putting in place to make things work, whether it's intentional calling. I've just finished a, a one-year program called Halftime. Many of you probably read the book, Halftime. They do something called a, uh, a cohort or a fellows program where for one year you get coached, you are with a group of about 10 other people, and you're walking in this journey of, you know, it says from success to significance. And, and yet I think it's great for us all to think about that no matter what our age is. Um, I signed up for that, frankly, just thinking, yeah, that's a great idea, right? From success to success, yeah, and that's plan the next 20 years and make it cool. Um, I, I was unprepared for how hard that was going to be. You know, what God's done when, when we've had these big jump-off points uh, and have taken meaningful risk, it's always been a stirring that is as if I can't say no, but I could say no. And so he, he took us through that even in this last year. Um, of, of a real fogginess before, he, he, before you know exactly what to do. And I think what God, in my experience of having done this now multiple times, 
what my sense is, is God's not saying you need to know what the two or three or five or 10 or 20 year plan is. He's just saying, follow me and be faithful in this immediate time, the next thing, the next yes. What is it today that I need to say yes to? What is it that I need to be saying yes to in the next week or the next month or the next year? And to, to be bold and willing to take major risks. Um, you know, one of the books that I, I, the book I brought today is this book called Treasure Principle. Hopefully many of you have read this, but it, there should be hopefully copies for everybody. Um, even if you have one, I'd encourage you to take one and give it away. And I brought this book for three reasons. Um, one is just the content of the book is amazing. So in, in my experience, as, as we live our lives, we have to keep in mind that our goals and our treasure is eternal, not here. And especially for those of us who work in the money business, um, we have to recognize that money has control in our hearts unlike anything else. Jesus says more in the Bible about money than he does any other subject. And if we don't treat it with that kind of seriousness, we are ripe for failure and for problems and for, for a disillusionment. So I spend a lot of my 30 years combating that by just reading things like this that remind me, hey, it, this is not what it is. When we went back into business, so you know, I mean, we went back into business from my time at the church with this calling back into marketplace, we were very deliberate to say we're going to cap our standard of living. We're going to um, uh, live as if we're missionaries and, and everything you know, and, give, and be very focused on giving. And so this book is a great thing on the, just its content alone. Secondly, um, I, I brought this book because one of my you know, loves is to connect with a lot of people in my business. We connect with a lot of CEOs. We connect with a lot of business leaders and the like. And just to be bold about sharing with them and talking with them and understanding them relationally, it's so easy to give books of any kind. Um, and if you're reading a lot of different great books, something will pop into mind and I'll send those. So very practically, um, that's, a, that's another reason why, you know, just having a stash of giveaway books when somebody comes through in my experience, it's been a great way to build relationships and have those conversations. So please take a copy there and, uh, and enjoy that. And if you've already got one, just find somebody to give it to, because I think those principles are so important. And so as we sit here today, um, you know, I think it's uh, the, the last thing I just want to say, because again, I think one of the unique things about my story is our family. And it's Ben, what I've learned along the way and what halftime just reminded me of is my coach in halftime was saying, Brian, your second half is about your wife being in her calling and being in her purpose and in her profession. So you came here thinking you are going to define your next 20 with her as a partner. And what I want you to do is what he would say to me is I want you to step away and not worry about what you're doing. And I want you to think about her giftedness and her calling and her purpose, and I want you to make that the number one priority. And I want, and, and that's why I love these things here for Valentine's Day, I want her to feel beautiful. I, you know, 15 years ago, someone said to me, Brian, you can know how you're doing in your marriage by how your wife is glowing, how she is interacting with the world. And so you need to take responsibility for that. If she's not doing well, that's on your shoulders. And so in the second half, one of these journeys that I'm on right now is saying, where is she amazing? And let's position her for amazing. My part's going to fall out okay, right? I, it's going to be whatever God has for us. But even if it's insignificant in any sort of world's eyes, my calling, my purpose, my vision right now is to make sure that she's set up to do amazing in that. And so I think as you rethink, I mean, the world just says to us all the time that profession and career is what matters and these other things are not as important and we all struggle with how do we make that. I just think, you know, in my experience, it's been willing to take risk, willing to make major changes, willing to move the family, willing to downsize, willing to do all these other things in a battle to keep these things more integrated and to, in, and to respond to Jesus when he's calling us to uh, that still small voice who's saying, read my word today, read that book, you know, uh, you know uh, get with those guys, pray, seek me. So that's my story. Thanks for letting me share it a bit.
So.